Hi everyone, this is Paul Sidorian for Security Weekly. I'm here with Peter Zaktow, also known as Mudge. Mudge, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Paul. Yes, it's wonderful to have you here uh, on the Security Weekly show. Uh, we've been, it's interesting, as you, when you worked for DARPA and when you worked for Google, we tried to get you on the show. There was like hoops you had to jump through. Um, so we finally, we finally got you. We found a time that works. So uh, it's, it's awesome to have you here. Great. Glad to be here. So, uh, Mudge, where does the – well, first, where does the name come from? I'm going to start off a non-traditional question. Usually I ask people how they get their start. I'm going to ask you where the name comes from. Uh, well, then I'm going to give you the same three answers I give just about everybody else. Um, the first one's uh, short and entirely a lie. The second one's you know, moderate and a half-truth. And the third one's a long, boring one. And the first one is it's my middle name. Uh, the second answer is um, you know, that if you choose a name that's not obviously a handle, uh, it makes your adversaries have to work a little bit harder doing their research. And then the third long, boring one was, I just found somebody's name, turned out to be a friend of mine, uh, I adopted it, uh, and uh, you know, I thought it just sounded like a cool name. Mudge is not terribly uncommon as an Irish last name, and in Boston, um, you know, there's a few of them in the phone books, which lends credence to the second answer as well. You are by far the most popular on Google, though. When you search for Mudge on Google, <laughs> you, you, you've got that SEO nailed. <laughs> Got it nailed down. Now, I used to work there. I don't want to draw any speculation, but I, I will say it was uh, it was more difficult to talk to the media when I was at Google than it was while I was uh, a senior in the Department of Defense. Right. Yes. Yeah. It seemed it seemed that way. It seemed that way. Uh, so, much. How did you get your start in information security? Uh, my start in information security. If, if you ask my wife, I didn't really have a chance. Uh, it goes all the way back to uh, the late 60s. <clears throat> in my crib, my dad uh, had Nixie tubes and vacuum tubes and sanded down sides of early um, uh, circuit boards uh, to make them into mobiles. I'm sure I have a fair amount of residual lead poisoning because of all that. But uh, <laughs> no, it's just I, I grew up with them. My, my father never wanted me to be afraid of computers. And he saw all of the scientists and researchers he was working with, you know, kind of fearing this new technology that was coming about. So... Uh, thank goodness I don't seem to have that fear. So now you actually went to music school uh, in Boston. And so tell us how you transitioned from that into uh, security. Well, <clears throat> you're correct. I, I, I did my undergrad in uh, music at Berkeley College of Music in Boston, which is kind of the, the more well-known Berkeley of the universities as soon as you you go to Japan or uh, the Asia Pacific area, uh, but if you're over here, everybody thinks uh, Berkeley, California. I had I played uh, classical violin. Oh, geez, since uh, probably around the age of four. Um, you know, I had a little cigar box with a ruler taped to it that my parents would, you know, make me walk around with, holding, learning the correct uh, positioning. Uh, it was it was pretty much torture. Uh, but I did that for about uh, 12, 13 years. Got to play with Dr. Suzuki. Uh, who was a well-known violinist, but I, I was doing computers at the same time ever since, you know, 1975, the Southwest Technical Products, Sweet Pea, um, and the Tektronics 4051 uh, that I kind of started on. And when it came time to go to college, um, you know, there weren't computer security courses. The, the computer, even uh, computer science was very nascent. Uh, so I said, you know what, I'm going for music. Uh, I've been dual tracking this my whole life. And the goal was just to do the music for myself, uh, because that's something that nobody can ever take away from me. You know, you lock me up, you put me in a prison, I can still do it in my head, I can still enjoy it. It's, you know, it's a mental exercise, and it's something I'm still passionate about and love. Uh, and then as the computers kind of came along, you know, I finished up college and I went right back into uh, the computers. And now, you know, some would say I actually helped create part of the industry that I'm, I'm playing in now. So uh, did you, had you graduated from school when you got involved with the Loft Group in Boston? Um, no, I was, I, I was still in college. Um, the Loft had not yet really been formed. Uh, there was the works. Uh, there was uh, RDT, Restricted Data Transmissions. Uh, there was you know, some ad hoc stuff. The 2600 meetings hadn't really uh, materialized in the Boston or Harvard Square area yet. So I, I started meeting them and hanging out with them, and, and that was when they just uh, were using it was an entirely different lineup, but it was more of just a storage facility uh, at the time, uh, and a couple of people playing some video games here and there. Uh, that kind of changed when I when I came in. 
That was their, uh, you're referring to their original location before they moved to a, a yet different location, correct? Yeah, that, the, the um, uh, South Boston location was just uh, a storage area for uh, computer parts uh, and also for a couple of the folks had wives who were trying to do a little uh, craft hat uh, and uh, fabrics um, hobbies. So when I, I got over there and I, I saw what they were doing and you know we, we knew each other, we, we all kind of hung out. Uh, and they were just starting to call themselves the loft. And I said, well, you know what, if, if we kind of got these systems to work together and set them up right, you know, we could, uh, we could hack the hell out of them, uh, in a way that, you know, we're not, we're not violating computer fraud and abuse act because, you know, there are our own systems mm. and it's a controlled environment and, you know, we can do a lot of good sharing this information. Uh, and that goes right back to that education question you had. Um, I didn't go to school for computer science because, they didn't have you know, that path hadn't been paved or trod yet in um, uh, computer security, and I wanted that information to be out there so somebody else could actually you know go take that path that didn't exist for me. Was that around nineteen ninety five or so? Yeah, it had to be around ninety five, ninety six um, time frame. Now you you authored a, a paper on buffer overflows in nineteen ninety five, actually predating smashing the stack for fun and profit. Actually, that one was um, used by ALF1 to do Smashing the Stack for Fun and Profit. He had a copy of my paper, and I think he also had Red Dragon's uh, paper. And I don't, I don't know if when Red Dragon's came out uh, compared to mine. I think it was afterwards. Uh, and it was humorous because I kind of dinged him a little bit, and I said, hey, you know, he did a great job. And, and that FRAC article... Uh, was really well done, and it took it further, and, and that's the goal. So I was really happy about it. But I did tease him, and I said, you know, a little shout out would have been a uh, uh, nice. And in fact, some people even thought that ALF one was uh, an al- an alternate uh, handle of mine because oh, you know there was just a, l- a large amount of you could take his paper and chunks of mine, and they were mm-hmm. verbatim. Um, so yeah, we it was a young industry. We didn't quite have the acknowledgement sections and the uh, plagiarism. It wasn't plagiarism. He improved upon it. Yeah, no, that's that's really cool, and it, it was very different sharing information back then, right? I mean, those were some of the few sources that you had at, at your disposal back then, if you wanted to get into computer security. Yeah, um, and you know, we all came from well, I came from the bulletin board scene and hanging out with some of the uh, the early freaks, uh, even that go back to the technical assistance uh, um, uh, party uh, tap with uh, Cheshire Catalyst and. Um, uh, Abby Hoffman, uh, if, if for folks who are old enough to remember him, um, and it was uh, that the economy was information, and right. if, on the bulletin board systems, you know, if you wanted to get access to more stuff, you had to contribute and produce, uh, and some people did that by just you know grabbing stuff from site A and moving it over to site B, um, but others, uh, myself included, took the tact of um, you know trying to create new information to share. And that was that was the the monetary value. Now now the monetary value is money. So at what point did the cult of the dead cow start to come into existence, and in, in what prompted your involvement with that group? So CDC and Loft overlapped for a long time. Um, you know, Death Veggie and um, uh, Freak Out, uh, White Knight. Um, I think uh, Omega. They, they were all in the Boston area, and they all hung out on the works. And they were all essentially you know, involved in the early loft uh, when it was just kind of that hangout and storage um, uh, facility. So um, always a fan. And eventually down the road, uh, they said, like, hey, can we uh, can we lift your S key uh, one time password hacking paper uh, mm-hmm. monkey monitoring keys uh, and re-release it as a CDC paper? We, we need some more technical Mm. Uh, uh, documents to be produced rather than just, you know, the Nancy Reagan gerbil feed bomb articles. Uh, and I said, sure. Um, so that uh, essentially they made me an honorary member, gave me a great backstory where apparently I was uh, found in New Mexico by two professors at Sandia National Labs. You know, I had been abandoned <laughs> by my parents and raised by wolves. So <laughs> There seems to be a lot of that with the CDC. It seems like the loft uh, always kind of uh, welcomed the limelight and they were a little more transparent. Uh, but the CDC still, to this day, kind of it remains that kind of like air of secrecy. Yeah, well, I mean, that's what happens when one of the groups is a media hacking group, and the other one is, you know, was a you know, uh, technology hacking group. Mm. Not to not to say that those are exclusive. 
uh, right, and right. those overlap in each. In fact, uh, BO2K, back or if is 2K, uh, was done by Dildog out of the loft. Uh, mm -hmm. And we actually, the, the reason loft was involved and the reason I, I, you know, was happy to kind of give the go ahead on that, given that back or if is, you know, had this sort of uh, nefarious tool to it, was the loft was experimenting with, um, well, this is, BO2K it was no different than an RDP or remote desktop uh, agent or administration, mm -hmm. PC Anywhere or remote desktop. And we actually created uh, a set of professional plugins that uh, made it entirely comparable with these commercial products. Uh, and in fact, you know, better in many ways to see if you could re-spin a tool or idea that had a negative connotation in the media mm -hmm. as something positive just because, you know, the only thing negative about it was the initial spin, not the actual tool itself. Uh, and it turned out that was really difficult to do. Um, you know, initial spin and the fun uh, the finality of functional fixation is tough to get around. So I'm curious, are the original CDC members, are they still involved in the community? So, uh, some of them are. Uh, mm -hmm. You'll see some of them pop up on Twitter and uh, CDC, uh, a couple of the CDC folks, unfortunately, have passed away recently. Um, and, you know, we, we keep in touch a little bit uh, and kind of poke and prod each other. But um, I, I don't see a lot uh, a lot from them. I'm, I'm sure I'll get pinged and, and dissed for saying <laughs> that. But that's, that's just uh, my not being involved in, right. in really a lot of the CDC uh, stuff going on. But I'm still a big fan of theirs. So in 1998, you had this long, flowing hair. And um, you were in this situation where you and a bunch of members of Loft went to testify in front of Congress. Uh, how did that come about, and, and what was that like? <laughs> well, okay. Uh, I guess I might as well reveal it here. This is your, what, 10th anniversary That's show. Right. Uh, so th this, is, this is a little bit of an involved story. But um, the punchline is uh, that I had gotten worried, based upon the popularity and notoriety that the Loft was getting, uh, that we were just going to be used as an example uh, from some um, maybe you know, not well-informed Department of Justice or other sort of, you know, crackdown. Not that we were doing anything wrong, but I, you know, we were we were the ones that were in the in the spotlight and in the crosshairs uh, a lot. So I had taken the tact of actually going out and um, uh, providing free courses uh, and training to anybody in the U.S. government in any agency or any branch, as long as it was just technically focused, and I would refuse to take. Uh, money or payment for it. I just thought that that was the right thing to do. The more educated they could be, the better decisions they would be able to make, whether it's technology decisions or policy decisions that are based upon a better understanding of technology. And I did the same thing for universities. So uh, while I was at the loft, you know, I, I, I lectured at the Army War College, at the Navy Postgraduate School. At, uh, I was involved with West Point a lot uh, in fact, that's probably one of the main reasons they had just recently inducted me into the uh, Army uh, 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 Order of Thor. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I taught uh, the I-4 and C-4 groups over at NSA. Um, I did some training courses for folks down at, at Quantico for Special Forces. You know, this was all during the loft time. And, you know, it was a little strange because the government was – you know, they were the other guys. They, they, you know, and we were, we were the hackers. Yeah. They were uh, watching you other branches. Well, that's <laughs> so they like to tell you that the, um, the problem was, you know, several of them, you kind of see exactly you know, what sort of spotlight or visibility they have within their own environments as compared to, you know, foreign, uh, areas where, you know, legally and internationally, they're allowed to have much more visibility. So they knew of us, but they didn't have much information. And that was why I needed to show them that we were, you know, a power of good, that we were not a bunch of evil, evil hackers that were breaking into U.S. corporations or other things, that we were just trying to uh, share information such that people could understand what risks they were dealing with in their computer and software, et cetera, uh, environments, and whether or not maybe they wanted to risk their personal or corporate uh, livelihood uh, on, you know, products that, you know, say, hey, we're secure, you know, and, that, and that's all there was to it. So... I kept doing that for a while and eventually word got around and, you know, people started like, you know, they, they'd ask for us to come over and anytime they'd ask for anything outside of like, um, uh, technology. And this did happen occasionally. Um, I just, you know, say, Nope, that's not the deal. And I'd get up and walk out because what are they going to do? They're not paying me. Um, they don't have anything over me. And that was kind of the, uh, you know, the way to even up the, even up the power. Cause the last thing I wanted, I didn't want the loft 
you know, to be brought up in Boston, uh, you know, by some bogus charges from the FBI uh, based upon something they read in the media. Uh, and then, you know, uh, some judge who doesn't you know, understand cyber um, because, you know, who did at that time? Uh, actually, you know, a lot of folks don't now. Uh, so I wanted to have that trump card where I could actually, you know, if that happened, call on some of the folks that I had taught how to do buffer overflows or how to reverse engineer or how to do timing attacks, race conditions, object reuse, et cetera, information disclosure leaks, um, and get some folks to to show up to that trial in uniform with a bunch of medals on saying, no, 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 yeah, these guys aren't that bad. Actually, you know, they explained to us how stuff works. And mm. that, that was the goal. Um, because of that, uh, and because I had done some work for uh, a lawyer, general counsel at, at the White House, uh, explaining, again, technology to them, uh, they reached out to me and said, hey, would you come testify um, you know, to the Senate? And the other loft guys actually didn't know this. Uh, so I had to set it up as, um, you know, kind of out of the blue and which made it a, ver a very interesting and awkward conversation because I'm all for it. And I'm like, hey, let's go down and testify to the Senate. Yeah. And, and they like, were like, they're, mm. like and they're like, what's going on? I'm like, ah, well, you know, who knows? You know, it's it, it's it, I'm sure it's nothing bad. And they're going, no, no. As soon as we're gone, they're going to raid the loft. And this is just, you know, a <laughs> trap and a trick. And I'm like, no, no, this is going to be good. We have to. We have to extend ourselves and put ourselves out there and, and demonstrate that, you know, that we're not a threat, that we actually you know, give a crap about security and we want the overall um, ecosystem to improve. Um, Much, how, how did you build the relationship with the various uh, agencies to be able to do that training and, and have those connections? Was it easier back then than it is today or was it, was it different? Well, I, you know, I don't know if it's easier back then than today because I don't have to start from scratch today. Um, and and I don't have to compete with a lot of folks who may not may or may not know what the hell they're talking about, uh, you know the snake oil versus non snake oil. Um, so it was slowly but surely, you know, somebody would um, say, hey, you know, I've got a friend who you know works over in the government and they're interested in this stuff and they're really having a tough time. Would you, you know, can you know, would you get in touch with them? Maybe, maybe explain to them how some of this stuff works. And then as soon as folks realize that your heart and your soul is involved um, and you don't have some sort of political or financial or other ulterior motive, word spreads pretty quickly because they want mm. uh, an unbiased uh, person that they can bounce things off of. That that actually worked for me very well in DARPA because um, at DARPA, you have a fixed period of, of, of time there. You're only there for a maximum of four years. And I got to brief the... Uh, the uh, the Joint Chiefs, you know, so all of the leaders of the, you know, the the, the three stars, you know, four stars of the different branches, Army, Navy, of course, Marines, et cetera. Um, and once they realized that I was just trying to level set and provide ground truth as to, you know, maybe an agency was claiming a capability that was actually a capability that they wanted to have, but was really much more aspirational right now, you know, and when you're trying to come up with your plans for, you know, a military, you know, event or defense um, you know, knowing what ground truth is, is really important. And for folks on a career path, oftentimes, you know, uh, their stuff is ever so slightly slanted, you know, to help them, uh, their career path, uh, evolve and grow. But being there as a person who's got a fixed, you know, a, a finite, mm -hmm. uh, lifespan and, and is, you know, and anything I do isn't going to help myself. Um, it's just to try and make things better. You know, they really grabbed onto that. And, uh, um, I was very uh, happy to be able to be that sort of voice of reason, and they'd reach out to me a lot. At, at what point, either before the testimony or was it during the testimony, did you uh, come up with the idea to for the 30 seconds comment of taking down the Internet? I, I had been um, working on BGP, the Border Gateway Protocol, uh, and I, I was the only person in the loft doing it. So I'm not sure uh, the other loft guys actually knew that was coming or or – that we are going to announce it because it was a question lobbed back out to us by Fred Thompson. Um, I had uh, been told prior to the meeting that that was one of the questions they are going to ask and they wanted to know what my response was going to be. Um, I think I was surprised after I, I was surprised that they threw 30 minutes into it. Um, maybe I threw 30 minutes into it. I'll have to go back and, and listen to it. But uh, I, I had tried to share with, um, responsible agencies 
uh, the risks and vulnerabilities of the Border Gateway Protocol and the ability to uh, segregate and uh, desynchronize, you know, the major backhaul parts of the of the internet. So it wasn't a surprise to me, mm-hmm. but the way folks picked up on that, yeah. that was a huge surprise. That seemed to be the takeaway from the testimony, right? And got all the press. Yeah, I, I was doing. A, we were all riding in a van back um, uh, from the testimony. And I was on a call with, uh, I think, uh, uh, Ira Flato for Science, NPR Science Friday. And uh, it was either that or it was a CBS News one because I was just doing interviews uh, left and right, like on a cell phone in, in the car. And it was, um, oh, I'm going to forget the guy's name from FBI, uh, uh, Michael Vadis, uh, FBI. I was later testifying to the Senate and I, uh, he and I were butting heads in a second uh, testimony that didn't receive that sort of coverage. And it was funny because, you know, that was the focus, you know, and as soon as I dropped off the line, we were listening to the rest of it. And it was nice that, you know, some of the folks in the know, and they were the Steve Bellavins and, and the Mike Vadis and folks like that, they were like, what? yeah, we know what he's describing, and it, it's actually not that difficult, unfortunately. Mm. No, that's interesting. Uh, so then at, at some period after that, um, well, you were instrumental in brokering the deal with At Stake. Is that is that correct? That, that, that is correct. Um, it had gotten to a point in the loft's life where uh, I and, and a couple of the other guys um, were really just stuck doing, uh, supporting these efforts that were bringing in the funds uh, that were, you know, paying the rent and keeping the electricity on. Um, you know, we kind of needed electricity given what we were doing. Uh, and uh, there was a little bit of frustration there. And, you know, I, I, I reached out to the other folks. We did a bunch of brainstorming sessions on, you know, what other efforts, what other projects could we do that would kind of lessen the load. Because uh, I think it was primarily Loft Crack and Annie Sniff. Uh, and then any, any time I went out to give a lecture or talk that wasn't for the U S government or for a, a university, you know, I just put the funds right back in and some of the other folks, you know, weren't doing that if they had a project like selling a CD compilation or something else, you know, they, they didn't want to contribute the funds back in and it was just this, this standard stuff. And I said, you know, we have to make sure that we're all able to play and have fun. Um, it can't just be that, you know, a couple of people, um, do the majority workload that's bringing the revenue, not saying other folks were not contributing in other ways. So um, I said, you know, let's uh, let's go out and see if we can't turn this garage band into something a little bit more mainstream. I know we're going to have to compromise in certain ways, um, but we'll reach a larger audience and uh, give it a shot. So yeah, I, I, uh, Weld Pond and I went around to the different VCs and other folks, um, really ill-equipped uh, at the time, mm-hmm. not understanding that world uh, the way I do now. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, luckily we ended up with battery, battery ventures. Uh, there were some other efforts, uh, and opportunities that we turned down. Um, if you have a moment, I'll tell you the, the hilarious one about, uh, I think it was CMP, um, CMGI. No, I'm going to forget the name of, uh, they were purchased by Novell. It was a venture capital firm or? Yeah, it was, it was another services, uh, firm that, that mm-hmm. wanted to buy us. And, uh, we, um, I didn't. I didn't trust them, so I cut a deal with them, and I said, you don't know exactly what you're buying, so why don't you sign a contract and let us do a full-scope penetration test against you? Oh, yeah, uh, I think I, Weld Pond was telling me about that. Yeah, and uh, Kevin Mitnick even wrote about it in one of his books where he uh, documents some you know, uh, stories and escapades on other folks. So the first thing we did is, is, with their approval, we went after all the folks involved in the negotiation and got their voicemails and their email accounts. And, yeah, he was and describing We were watching, yeah, <laughs> we were watching that back and forth. And we pretty much realized that um, yeah, they just wanted myself and Weld um, and that they were going to scuttle the, the rest of the team. And they didn't, they didn't see the value, which to me was a huge omission. You know, we were way ahead of the curve on hardware. We were way ahead of the curve on radio. Um, we understood that all of those things worked together. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was nice to walk into the negotiations uh, after they had provided us that mm-hmm. back door. So what were the early days like at, at, at stake? There was, um, from what I'm told, there was a lot of money that was uh, funneled your way. And you had a much nicer office and fish tanks and stuff, right? Not necessarily my way. Um, this was the dot-com uh, boom, mm-hmm. which uh, uh, and it was interesting. Uh, the, John Rando was the um, on our board. Uh, he was the former, I guess, chairman of the board for uh, DEC, and that became part of Compact Services. And he was actually really good. We had 
we struggled because we didn't have any management for the first, I'd say, six months. And, you know, I was young at this. And uh, um, John Rando even said, like, look, the only person who, who belongs to sit at that at that executive table with, you know, and, and talk to me is, is Mudge. And that was knowing how naive and young I was even then. I'm like, oh, this sucks. We're, we're, in, we're in bad shape. And they did all of the classic mistakes. You know, they bought air on chairs. They mm-hmm. gave everybody, you know, palm pilots and stuff going in. And, you know, then, of course, when, you know, the, uh, you have to tighten the belts, it makes it really awkward when you're like, oh, well, we're not giving those out anymore. We want them back. Um, I fought to get the first uh, interim CEO removed. Uh, I brought in uh, Chris Darby, who's now the CEO of Incutel mm-hmm. um, at the time. Uh, it was um, that there was a lot of there were there were some interesting things going on, and it was a huge learning experience. Um, and to be honest, it was the first pure play computer security consultancy, um, and I really think that was that was valuable, and I don't think it was capitalized on. Um, because you do need that Ralph Nader, Rachel Carson, Consumer Reports, you know, sort of underwriters laboratory, um, where you're just focused on uh, informing, educating, and protecting the consumer. And in that case, the consumers were the companies that were hiring us to go in and do analysis of their environments or of of their software tools or what they were considering purchasing or acquiring. Um, Because if you look at something else, like, you know, a large company that sells a product and offers services in addition to that, you know, how much are you going to be surprised when Cisco's consulting arm comes in and says, okay, here's our recommendations. You should buy Cisco gear. Mm. Um, now, that might be the correct, you know, suggestion. But, you know, as the consumer, uh, the incentive structures get weird when, uh, when anything else is involved, including money, um, that might bias uh, your judgment or recommendation. So at, at some point, Later, and a lot has been written about this Mudge. People are asking, like, "Where's Mudge?" Do you, what it, you know? What can you tell me about what happened at that at that time? So I was in charge of um, not only the R and D group, um, but I was also in charge of hiring. Uh, they had given me the IT group. Uh, I think the organization had grown to about um, you know a few hundred, maybe mm-hmm. three hundred people uh, at that point. We were on multiple continents. And uh, they were using me heavily for recruiting, for sales, uh, and also for, uh, you know, kind of like messaging and and PR. Uh, And in hindsight, that was way too much um, because I didn't want to fail in any one of those jobs. But any one of those jobs was, you know, more than a full-time job at at a startup at that size and with the scope and and, and breadth they were trying to reach. So uh, eventually... um, I got a recommendation from a friend uh, to go see uh, a therapist because they're like, "Look, you know, you just have all this anxiety and, and you mask it well." And I went to the uh, so I went to the therapist and they uh, they prescribed you know some anti anxiety and antidepressants. And uh, lo and behold, uh, I'm one of those people that have those negative responses that you hear about and read about mm-hmm. or th- see in the commercials on the TV. Mm-hmm. Um, and they didn't know that about these at the time. They were just being pro- cross-prescribed. They were, you know, serotonin, neuroepinephrine, uh, dopamine inhibitor, stuff like that. Uh, so the side effects hadn't really been uh, divulged. And that did not go well for me. And I had to, I had to check out on a short-term disability. Mm-hmm. And, but now you came back from that, and I'm assuming using your contacts you had built up at the loft, uh, did a lot of work for the, the government. Is that correct? Well, uh, Richard Clark and I went way back, uh, and I used to go in to see him at the White House. The, the Clinton administration had a very open-door policy, um, so I was in and out of there uh, a lot, um, even, during the, even during the tougher times. Uh, mm-hmm. And then after, af- after 9-11... Um, I pretty much uh, just devoted my time to providing um, help and tracking on critical infrastructure, mm-hmm. telecommunications, transportation, uh, energy, uh, and finance, and identifying vulnerabilities in a way um, and sharing them, uh, A, without uh, illegally crossing any lines because you know I, I am a scholar of CFAA and ECPA, uh, and two, because I wasn't um, officially part of the government. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I could I could uh, perform analysis on U.S. entities as long as I didn't you know break any laws that they would have a difficult time doing. Right, and this is after your departure from At Stake. 
Correct. So that, that had ended at, at that point. Well, I, they were still listing me, uh, mm-hmm. and they were still advertising me for some time, and you know that was a little disturbing. Um, but you know, it is what it is. And so the story goes that you were seated at the same table as President Clinton. Is that correct? Uh, I was indeed. And so did you get a chance to talk to President Clinton? Like, uh, uh, he comes up on people's list of, like, people you want to have dinner with, right? Like, I would love to have dinner with, with Clinton. That'd be awesome. <laughs> uh, so did you get a chance to converse with him, or are you just kind of in the same meeting? No, I, I had a chance to converse with him. Um, I actually got a chance uh, um, several times to, to uh, speak with him, and, and I got to speak with him at that, uh, at that uh, um, event uh, in private after everybody else left. I envision it much like the episode of Family Guy. Is it not like that when you meet? <laughs> no. Um, it, it was. It was a little awkward because um, this was this was just after the um, uh, the wave of distributed denial of service attacks, and mm-hmm. at stake was going. So I was I was still at at stake, and um, uh, I forget. I think Chris Darby and and Mobley and some of the other folks were. Uh, came in and they're like, oh, look, they're having this big event at the White House and all these heads of industry uh, um, have been invited to sit at the Oval Office table with Clinton. Oh, man, you know, that, it would be great if we, you know, if we were there. Um, so I said, well, do you want me to be there? And they're like, yeah, ha, ha, ha. So, you know, I, I called up my contacts and said, how about throwing me a bone for the help that we've been, you know, that I've mm-hmm. uh, done? And they said, oh, yeah, our, our mistake, you should have been there in the first place. That's also where my name was leaked. Um, it was the White House that uh, I, I had done a relatively decent job of keeping Mudge and, and mm-hmm. Zatko apart. And the White House Communications Agency and the press corps um, just took the roster list for the invites, uh, you know, the access list, and gave it to the media. And the media published it. And then somebody in the media who was the trusted confidant uh, that, that I used to use uh, for certain media things uh, called up aloft and said, hey, is, is that Mudge's real name? So I called up the White House and I said, um, you guys just, just handed out my real name. And they said, oh, oh, don't worry about it. Uh, we'll fix that. <laughs> and I said, I, I, no, no, I, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, great. Okay, cool. And I hung up the phone and it took me about like an hour before I'm like, wait a second. How are they going to fix that? And what they had done is they, re- they released a second press release that simply had that one name removed and Mudge replaced by it. <laughs> I was like, oh, you fixed it all right. You removed yeah, all doubt. It it, yes, exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, so, so the, the meeting with the meeting with Clinton, after everybody left, uh, and I was seated right at the uh, Oval Office table, which was kind of nice. I was next to, um, uh, um, oh, I can't remember her name now. I'm having a senior moment. Anyway, um, let's see, Bill Clinton was tall. Al Gore is taller. I want to say Janet Reno, but it's not Janet Reno whatever uh they all left and you know i'm just kind of hanging back and the president's hanging back and the secret service guys are are at the door man i'm looking around and and i see you know, my my friend uh richard clark there i kind of go like you know do i need to leave and he's like no nah, you know, chill out so um it was just me and uh, uh dick clark and um bill clinton and we uh chatted a bit he was really impressive and and the folks are right when he comes in he had this personality and charisma you know i mean he, he was the life of the party and he was really quick uh um to take in new data he would then you know uh say it back to you but give it in a different context to uh and and, and say you know is that what you're implying to show or refute you know that he has the correct grasp of it and uh just multifaceted you know uh, very renaissance that's really cool. Uh, so from there, you went to work for DARPA. Is that correct? Um, there were a few things in between. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I did some work uh, helping a couple of companies uh, start up. Uh, I you know, went back to work over at uh, BBN Technologies, which was you know the organization that actually designed TCP/IP protocol suite and did the internet on the original DARPA contract. Uh, and that's also where uh, early loft days, I got all of the other loft guys essentially uh, their first real jobs. You know, uh, before we did the loft full time, uh, so they all worked either for me or or I got them in uh, to that organization. And um, uh, it was a government contractor, uh, and I was asked to to come back um, because one of their customers had a pressing need for some of my expertise. Uh, 
Um, and then I had the opportunity uh, with um, Regina Dugan, the first uh, woman director of DARPA, uh, and you know a very different personality than the the prior director of DARPA, uh, Dr. Tony Tether. Uh, actually, I'm not I'm not sure if he's a doctor. Um, and I said, you know, this this is a great opportunity. Let me go in and see if I can't um, shake things up. Because in my eye, DARPA was this wonderful, beautiful gem of an institution, you know, to be cherished as an innovation engine for the U.S. and, and the world. Uh, and uh, I really viewed that it had lost its way, uh, especially when it comes to cyber computer security. Where uh, where is DARPA reported up through? Has it been the same same chain over the years? Uh, it's changed a few times. It used to be on par, I believe, with DDR&E, um, and now it reports in through DDR&E. Mm -hmm. But the beauty of uh, which, which is out of the, the Pentagon for the uh, under the um, uh, Secretary of Defense. Okay. The the beauty of um, of DARPA is that is that it's this kind of autonomous entity, and it doesn't take instructions, and it doesn't take um, taskings uh, explicitly as to you need to solve problems X Y Z. And the program managers, when they come in, um, are trusted to go out and figure out what the problems X, Y, and Z are, uh, to direct the money as they see fit, uh, to try and solve these in a strategic fashion rather than any sort of tactical short-term uh, procedure. And you get this wonderful backstage pass across the services, across the intelligence communities, to kind of see what the challenges they're going to have based upon how they're operating day to day. Um, are or are not going to paint them into corners. And it's your job to, you know, come up with new efforts that will, you know, free them from those corners should they find themselves there. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, I, that's also why, um, because you have such autonomy uh, and you come in essentially as the equivalent of a one-star general, um, that, you know, it's a fixed term. Uh, you do not want somebody uh, directing uh, discretionary taxpayer money uh, towards their pet project for two, three, four, 10, 15, 20 years, you know, well after it should have been put down or transitioned out. So you had a, a limited time that you were going to spend at, at DARPA, is that, is that correct? That's correct. And so what were, I mean, some people are uh, familiar with the projects that you were there, but what were some of the bigger projects that you led while you were there? Well, I, I um, ended up taking the entire, you know, uh, burgeoning cyber uh, group out of uh, uh, Stowe, the Strategic Technologies Office, and we moved that into a new office called I2O, the Information Innovation Office. Um, and I think one of the things I'm most proud of was I did a, a lion's share of creating something known as the DARPA Cyber Analytic Framework, which kind of shaped how the agency evaluates and considers projects and efforts uh, to pursue uh, mm -hmm. in cyber, you know, offense, defense, what have you, as the, as the DOD would say, the full, 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 full range computer network operations or full spectrum CNO. Um, and that was very useful inside, uh, the agency, uh, and inside the government, um, to kind of identify what things we had been working on that were more tactical and that we should just scuttle, uh, and how to identify, you know, some of the unintended consequences or asymmetries that didn't work for some of our strategic efforts. Um, but so that was kind of a, a, a larger, you know, meta project. Uh, I ran a bunch of, I ran a gambit of things ranging in classification levels. Uh, so the ones that publicly uh, I used to, that folks might know about was Cinder. Uh, and Cinder was uh, how to find uh, autonomous APT when that APT really starts to rapidly evolve. Um, so not like your uh, Dooku's or Flames or Gauss's currently, but what happens when the defenders start to really catch up with them? And hence, you know, the attacker gets a play as well. This isn't a single a single turn game. Um, and they evolve up, you know, how do you deal with those sorts of autonomous APTs uh, controlled from around the world? Uh, some of the other ones were... Um, yeah, I, I was going to say, much. I, I remember the Shmukon presentation in 2011 when you announced the cyber... I don't know if that was the official announcement of it. I believe so. Um, I could be quoting Wikipedia, so you're obviously <laughs> the authoritative source. But in 2011, you spoke at Shmukon about the Cyber Fast Track program, which is the one that most of us are familiar with. Yeah, most people remember Cyber Fast Track. And uh, that, was, that was what I ultimately went to DARPA to do. Um, you know, not the military networking protocol, not Cinder, not not the other ones. Although 
I had a lot of fun with some of those other projects. But um, yeah, Cyber Fast Track was a meta hack, if you will. And that was a hack. I, I wanted to go in and hack government contracting. Uh, Doug Song, who wrote uh, DSNF mm -hmm. and you know uh, was one of the founders of Arbor Networks and I think is now over at Duo Security, uh, is one of the founders there. Um, I had chatted with him and I said, you know, now that a hacker has a seat at the table, uh, at DARPA, you know, what do we do to change, you know, to change things for the better? And and <laughs> I'll never forget it. Other folks were, you know, giving me technical challenges or why haven't we been able to solve this or why is our security lunch still being eaten by, you know, amateurs? Uh, and he said, fix government contracting. That's mm. <laughs> like, okay. Uh, and he explained, you know, what he meant by what the challenges were. And uh, yeah, so I decided to make it such that in Cyber Fast Track, uh, anybody could apply, uh, didn't matter whether you were U.S. or not, um, uh, didn't matter if you were a large corporation or an individual working out of your basement. Um, and the onus, you know, there was not a huge level of effort to uh, write like, you know, a 50-page proposal. You didn't have to wait for months and months and months to find out whether you uh, uh, were being awarded or not. Uh, and I ended up funding, I think it was about 120, 130 efforts. We got about 560, 570 uh, proposal submissions. Uh, the average time from when we got a proposal to when we turned around and gave them money and had them on contract and working on the effort that they proposed uh, was, I think, four working days. Uh, yeah, and that's much, and you, you really did meet your goals. I mean, being in the security community, I remember that time. In fact, I'm personally involved with some projects today, even still, that were funded by Cyber Fast Track. And I remember my friends going, oh, yeah, I'm doing the Cyber Fast Track thing. You, know, you should look into that. Yep. And it was really, I mean, it supported the, all these awesome projects in the community, many of which are still flourishing today, which is awesome. And it shook up the government. And it shook up the government in the way that I wanted it to. Um, it showed them that... Uh, oftentimes what they were paying for from large defense industrial based contractors at, you know, 10 million, 20 million, 30 million dollar, uh, levels of effort over four or five years were able to be accomplished at a higher quality level, um, in three months to four months, you know, by little individuals. And, and that's just resetting, like, here's what the, here's what the level of the state of the art actually is. And if you don't know that mm. you can't, I mean, I'm not blaming these contractors and I'm not blaming the government. They didn't know what was capable. They didn't know where the industry had gone. And as such, they couldn't evaluate what was, you know, the best use uh, of the funds. And then the government was oftentimes saying, well, we can't operate, you know, quickly enough. So we should just let the commercial world solve these problems and we'll adopt whatever solutions they have. And I'm terrified by that because the commercial world is incentivized by different things. The antivirus world, you know, would be very reluctant to actually remove the existence of all viruses. So it would put themselves out of business. But the government wants the removal of all viruses for their continuity of operations. So you have these strange, perverse incentive structures that might seem aligned but aren't. Uh, and, you know, and I said, the speed's not the problem. Here, I can show you. And, and Cyber Fast Track was faster on the contracting than the commercial world uh, is, is capable of doing. It was a one-page commercial contract. Some of the things that folks might be aware of out of there, Red Balloon Security, uh, Hack RF, um, you know, there are uh, components that are in Apple's compiler for security. Uh, now LLVM has adopted certain parts. Um, you know, so it's really touched everything. Um, but the goal was that if you proposed something trying to solve a government problem, I would not fund it. If you proposed something trying to solve a problem that you cared about, that you were intimately aware of and familiar with and knowledgeable about in your particular area, and you could describe that, um, I would fund that because mm -hmm. I'd be able to find an area that that's going to be mm -hmm. relevant to the government later on. But I didn't want people trying to solve government problems because you don't know the sorts of problems they have. <laughs> right, right. And when you try to, you know, to, to, to suppose or hypothesize on them, you come up with these strange incentives and these strange unintended consequences. And it, it doesn't get – neither party wins. So now you moved on from DARPA and went to Google, but that cyber fast track, is there uh, anything that's going to happen that's similar to that in the future? Well, um, I know AFRL, uh, Air Force Research Lab in Rome, New York, uh, has uh, put money aside for a couple of efforts that were inspired by 
uh, Cyber Fast Track. I haven't tracked what they were doing on those. I know that there was an effort inside DARPA. I don't know the future of it called Robotics Fast Track. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, my, through the grapevine, I'm hearing that it really wasn't. Um, not everybody's heart was behind it, and they might have taken a couple of shortcuts compared to uh, Cyber Fast Track. Cyber mm-hmm. Fast Track was a lot of work on the back end. I bet. You know, I people people were just amazed. I mean, that was my passion. It was why I went to DARPA. Um, but it meant I didn't get a weekend off. I didn't get a night off. I didn't get a vacation day, you know, um, and it was round the clock. Uh, and, you know, it's going to take somebody who's that passionate about reaching out to their industry to help them um, to to do the next version of it. But there are little things here and there. Um, and sometimes that's how you affect big change or little ripples that, you know, change the current or tides. So tell us a little bit about your work at Google, as much as you can describe. You, it was funny, we were joking before the show, you're like, it was hard for you yourself to speak uh, when you worked at, at Google. Well, yeah, yeah they're, they're a large company, and, and they like to have a consistent, uh, cohesive story going out to the media. So they, they can't allow all of their um, VPs to you know, just go out and, and you know, ad, ad-lib what they want. But I, I went over to, um, my time at DARPA was up. And so I, I reached out uh, to Regina Dugan, who had left uh, DARPA, uh, and Ken Gabriel, who was the deputy director of DARPA at the time, had left. And they both ended up going over to Google to create this group called ATAP, the Advanced Technology and Projects Group. And so I said, hey, you know, what's up? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm leaving. And they're like, oh, oh, uh, are you reaching out to us? In which case, you know, talk to these other people uh, because, you know, they wanted to make sure everything was propri- it was uh, kosher. Right. Um, with, with, you know, didn't want me getting special favors. And I went out there originally as a program manager, a TPL technical project lead, uh, which was, uh, a corporate vice president level at Motorola. And my goal was, and I released it and there's a video up there at, at Google IO. Uh, I put a full, um, uh, computer, think of a trusted, uh, computing platform, a trusted platform module, but one that can handle a few megabytes a second IO speed with a full 32-bit processor and gigs and gigs of storage just dedicated to the user, not dedicated to um, uh, content protection or copyright uh, sort of things. So that you own, that you control, that you move with you from device to device. Uh, And as that was moving forward, I got the opportunity to step up and I was the deputy director of ATAP. So I took Ken Gabriel's position as he moved over to become the uh, president and CEO of Draper Labs. Cool. Uh, I I really want to hear what you're doing at uh, or for the UL. You know, this has come on my radar, and hopefully you can shed a little more light on it. I only know what I read in press releases, <laughs> um, but uh, I see companies like uh, Codenomicon uh, made a press release that they are working with the UL very closely. And for someone like me who does a lot of research into embedded devices and IoT-based devices, and I'm gravely concerned about the security, I looked at that as a big step forward and potentially a place where UL can come in and really help the state of security in a lot of these embedded systems. So that's, of course, a very narrow view. I'm sure you have a much more expanded view and can expand upon that topic a lot more than I could. So I'm, I'm, let me be very clear. Uh, first off, uh, the individual details about the project that I'm working on, mm-hmm. uh, in particular the project that has received some government funding, um, you know, I'm not going to talk to those because I don't want to go crosswise with the public affairs office and send a mixed message as to whatever they're doing. But I can speak about the organization that I set up, mm-hmm. um, which is the Cyber Independent Testing Laboratories, which we're filing for 501c3 uh, nonprofit status. Again, this is all modeled off of Consumers Union, which brought you consumer reports. And while I've, you know, tossed the term around of cyber UL, uh, that's a reference back to John Tan, uh, one of the other Loft members' article he wrote in 1998 explaining uh, how the uh, Underwriters Laboratory approached rating and measuring the efficacy of safes and vaults for banks. Uh, and it wasn't a certification process so much as it was a, here's the standard tools, drills, manipulation, acid, mm-hmm. explos- explosives, and here's how long the vaults you know, withstood these sorts of you know, uh, types of attacks, and hence that was a rating less less than a uh, less than a certification. So, if your if your safe said was a TL fifteen, meaning that it could withstand fifteen minutes of drilling and ma- manipulation before it gave up the ghost, uh, and um, your security guard only walked around 
every 30 minutes, um, you know, that might not be the right safe for your environment. That exposes a bit too much risk. But it's probably a cheaper safe than like a TL60. Um, and if you have a security guard that goes around every five or 10 minutes, a TL15 might be just fine, you know, because it's a, a smaller window. Uh, so the consumer ends up having some amount of information uh, to gauge a, you know, what so, how well the safe was made, how well it was withstands certain poking and prodding. And this all to me was very similar to consumers report, uh, consumer reports. Right. You know, I, I look at how they do vehicles. And I don't have to have the source code or I don't have to actually have access to the Ford or Chevy or GM or uh, Daimler Chrysler uh, uh, plants to inspect their machines. I can measure the tolerances and how well the, do- you know, the seams are welded and you know, the, uh, the, the spacing and gaps between the doors. I can look at the crash test information. I can perform my own crash test information. I can you know, rip it apart. And, you know, it, and I, get a, I get an understanding of the hygiene and the level of detail and quality as it goes to security. And Much, so, would, it, would it be accurate to say they put a certification around how resilient the product is, for example? Who's they? Uh, UL, UL or uh, the UL. Is that, well, is that how you describe the rating? Well, so, so the ratings I'm talking about aren't, uh, aren't so much like that. Uh, so I would prefer to, to equate it with consumer reports. And I'm not working with the UL. Mm-hmm. Um, I just use that as an example to cite uh, John Tan's um, I want to be able to give comparative information similar to the Energy Star ratings uh, that you'd see on appliances mm-hmm. okay. or the vehicle, the, the, the Monroney uh, uh, labels, you know, the vehicle disclosure information you see on cars at the, at the dealership or, you know, my favorite, the nutritional uh, uh, FDA labels on mm-hmm. the sides of, of food. I want to quickly be able to look at it and I want to say, you know, um, did this thing uh, withstand 10,000 hours of dump buzzing without going belly up? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, did you know how many of the uh, thirty horrific libc function calls are used in there that are very difficult to secure? Uh, what's the runtime complexity? What's the uh, algorithmic complexity? You know, are any are the standard things like stack protection uh, uh, in place? So, you know, do they have control flow integrity? You know, what's the linking and build? If if you look at what was a Kaspersky, it was recently pointed out had been compiling you know all of their software for ages without. Uh, stack guards and cookie protection in there. Mm-hmm. That's been the default in Microsoft's compilation suite for 10 years. Mm-hmm. So I want to be able to look at that nutrition, you know, nutri- nutritional facts and say, you know, Kaspersky versus somebody else or, you know, McAfee, Semantic, whatever, Avast. I don't care, but I want to get a quantified uh, knowledge of the hygiene and robustness and how much effort they put in during the build process so that I can understand what that little, hey, it's secure you know, saying that they're uh, trying to banter around for marketing actually means as a consumer. So uh, you're using the kind of inspiration from uh, the UL to create a uh, cyber UL, as you described. Yeah, uh, 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 cyber consumer reports. Yeah, okay. And And is is this a a government uh, funded project or uh, something you're creating on your own? So the government approached me uh, about, uh, and this is something that I've been trying to do during the loft. This was something I encouraged John Tan uh, to look into. We couldn't find a lot of detail on consumer reports, but we were able to find information on Underwriters Laboratory, and that's why that site towards the Cyber UL uh, document came out. It goes back to at stake, how how I insisted that we be vendor neutral um, in our analysis and what we were recommending. Um, and, uh, so the government is now, you know, catching on and they want something like this. So I got a phone call at not this last DEF CON, but the one before from the white house, you know, asking if, if, if a new government entity were to be stood up, um, that was like a cyber UL, would I be interested in being the director or CEO? Uh, and I said, oh, I'm, I'm really flattered, but no, uh, I would not accept that. Uh, and they were a little shocked. And they said, why? And I explained to them all of the challenges of getting the funding and the congressional oversight and, you know, how it was going to be done and the speed and rapidity. And, you know, here's what I learned from Cyber Fast Track as to what works inside the government and what doesn't. And I said, I'll tell you what I'll do, though. I'm going to go and stand it up on my own. I'll make sure it's a nonprofit um, so that, you know, we remove a bunch of these strange incentive structures as to who's getting the benefit out of it. I'll model it off of consumers uh, union consumer reports. And once I have it lined up, um, I'm going to come back to you and hopefully GAO and other places are going to be, you know, chomping at the bit to, to get some of the output and results um, so that we can start to quantify 
you know, what the risks are in different environments and, you know, how risk a particular piece of software is compared to another one. That's excellent. So how far along are you in the process? Well, this isn't cyber fast track. So let's see, mm -hmm. that was about 15, 16 months ago. And uh, I think I finally got the award um, maybe like 14 days ago. Uh, yeah. But um, the nice thing is that's, that's the award for, for a, a subcomponent of the effort. But the organization has stood up uh, and I've got most of the technical hard problems already, uh, I think, cleared away. And it's a matter of executing on them. I, I managed to lift a few ideas that I learned from Google as to um, strong data analytics. So um, there's a predictable component, and you know it's all based off of Bayes and uh, linear regression, as one might expect. Uh, and there's a bunch of static um, analysis to determine you know how stuff was built and and what the compiler settings were. And then there's some really interesting runtime stuff. And um, tip of the hat to uh, Mike Zalewski for helping uh, remove a couple of the barriers there. And you'll see a few more things being churned back in and contributed back to that uh, for some interesting um, uh, complexity uh, identification uh, capabilities. Fantastic. Uh, so is this, uh, my last question along these lines, is this targeted more at software? It, does it, can it hit embedded devices and some of the IoT issues that we're, that we're facing today? Um, you know, like how, how far in scope are you with, with this project? So the scope is uh, software, software and systems, mm -hmm. and by that I mean firmware. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't I don't care whether it's firmware that I'm yanking off of, um, you know, some bit of memory connected on a uh, a spy wire uh, from a, an embedded system. Uh, I don't care whether it's an M zero through M four or M five. A lot of the analysis uh, still works, and mm -hmm. just like those nutritional facts, I don't care whether you're talking about fruits and vegetables or whether you're talking about a Big Mac, um, or you know what have you, or, or astronaut ice cream. The nutritional facts are still uh, applicable across that entire range, whether it's um, large systems, distributed systems, uh, applications on devices, or embedded systems. The Internet of Things or the Internet of Things that can kill you. Mudge, are you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? Oh, boy. I'll go. I, I have to apologize because uh, uh, this is going to show that um, I really don't watch much on the web. So, uh, yes. That's okay. It, com <laughs> it comes out better when you're not prepared for the five questions, which have remained oh, the same for quite some time. So. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, and there's no right or wrong answer uh -huh. much. Right. So, you know. But there are stupid answers. <laughs> I, hey, I'm not one to judge, okay? <laughs> Three words to describe yourself. Uh, um, contrarian, um, obsessive, uh, and um, not in a good way, but relentless. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? <laughs> uh, pugs. If and uh, as, as a supervillain, uh, I would be called the Pugler. <laughs> I have three pugs myself, so <laughs> oh, <you laughs> I'm armed and ready to go. If you would have told me that, I would have been on this. Uh, uh, I would have done this like years ago. Oh, that's hilarious! Sorry, we'll talk after the show. Uh, if you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Uh, an American Tall Tale. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first <laughs> or second? Uh, I prefer only to play with Jason Mayhem Miller. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Frank Zappa and Abby Hoffman. It would obviously be a modern wedding, a modern relationship. Excellent. Mudge, thank you so much for appearing on Security Weekly. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Paul. All Take right. care. Thanks, everyone.